Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you here with us for our second lab meeting event of the NAFTA Sitside Leaders Series. Um, my name is Sarah Kern. I'm the citizen science strategist for NASA at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and I support Mark Kushner and support all of the citizen science projects that are sponsored and supported by NASA. So we're really excited to have this conversation today with folks from Backyard Worlds Project. So this is one of the kind of longstanding and most scientifically prolific projects out there. So there's a lot, there's a lot that I'm curious about. What can we learn and what can we share with other projects to help them be as productive? A couple of reminders as we be, we begin. We are recording today's event so we can share it on our website. So make sure you're muted if you're not speaking, if there's noise around you. Um, and the closed captions, I'm so glad I have this there, are, will be enabled in a moment, so turn those on as you'd like. Um, and our event today, uh, this is the kind of a general outline. It's pretty loose and we really wanna have a good conversation with all of you, so time can move around a little bit. Uh, we're gonna hear from the Backyard Worlds team, an overview of the project, what's involved. Uh, and then they have two interesting questions to bring forward to you all that we can all kind of weigh in on and learn from. The first is around um, swift, how do you create swifter feedback for participants to help them learn and participate more effectively and happily? And the second question is around why there, what's, what is behind the dearth of women and specifically in the advanced user group of Backyard Worlds and what can we learn from progress that's been made in other areas of astronomy or other areas of sciences to help even out this gender imbalance? So we'll pause in the after the first question, uh, have a conversation, we'll come back to the team and a few slides before the second um, conversation. And then we will definitely have lots of time for uh, interaction with the audience. So we're really glad you're here. Use the chat as you like. Um, and I think the group is small enough that we can have people come online um, and share their own questions. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna introduce Mark Kushner, who is the NASA Citizen Science Officer um, <laughs> and one of the founders of the Backyard Worlds Project. And he's probably not a stranger to you, but I'll give it over to you, Mark. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you. I'm joined today by three total superstars um, so, um, for Reed Sedano, uh, Leopold Gomez and Adam Schneider are here to talk to you guys. Um, so for Reed, just totally outstanding volunteer on the Backyard Worlds Project. He's writing his own code. He's writing his own, um, photometry code, uh, which is going to serve you just everybody who just uses infrared data. I mean, what a great contribution to the field. And uh, Freed is a, an undergraduate in, in Orlando. And by the way, Freed is looking for a summer internship. If anybody who looks is interested in a really real go-getter uh, to do some science with you for the summer, we've got your man. Leopold, um, one of our, again, superstar. He's been in the press multiple times. Um, he's um, one of... Uh, just a very uh, small number of of citizen scientists who have won their own JWST time. Uh, so I'll ask him questions about that later. Um, Dr. Adam Schneider is a uh, staff scientist at the uh, U.S. Naval Observatory at Flagstaff. Um, he I met him when he was a postdoc. Very luckily, I stumbled into him. He just had this total record breaking thesis involving like um, a million combing through millions of objects to find find uh, really special brown dwarfs. And um, I think of him now as as the person who discovered the uh, extreme T sub dwarfs. Uh, but he just um, he's like the glue that makes our project go. Anyway, thank you guys. So I'm here essentially uh, cup in hand, begging you guys for help. Um, we're Backyard Worlds project, family of projects now, um, is, a, is an experiment. Uh, it's it's a lot of experiments. Besides being a science experiment, it's a huge experiment in, in understanding people and um, in building collaborations. And so I'm here to ask you for help. 
to figure out how to improve it. So let me just say a little bit about how the project works. Next slide, please. And then when I run out of voice, Adam offered to take over. <laughs> um, so the project is a, it's a Zooniverse project. So we have a whole lot of data from NASA's uh, Wide Field Explorer mission. And we put it online, uh, literally a million different little movies, a million movies like this. The movies consist of four frames where there's a lot of junk in the background and every now and then there are gems. So you can see in this movie, um, there's a little red dot that's moving in a linear pattern. Thank you, whoever is waving that uh, arrow. I think that's Sarah. Uh, there's the gem. Um, and the noise, of course, is all kinds of other stuff that kind of disappears and reappears and kind of circles around and does all kinds of other junk in the background. Um, and the human eye, you know, uh, is really good at picking out moving objects amongst background noise, so which has probably served our species well, prevented us from being eaten by lions and so on. So, um, and then this is just the gateway to the project. So people go online and they do this task and then hopefully they get sucked into our little world and they do all sorts of advanced projects. Um, so um, project's been online since 2017. Um, it was, this is my second project that I, I got involved in as a scientist. So we've had some time to, to to mess around with it, and we've had a huge amount of success. We've had um, more than one hundred seventy five thousand different um, unique URLs. You, sorry, unique. Um, what do you call it? Um, what do you call the the marker that tells IP you? address? IP addresses. Thank you. Um, unique IP addresses. So um, I don't know. It's not a precise way to translate unique IP address into unique volunteer. However, order of magnitude is, is probably about the same. Uh, so a whole lot of volunteers from, from around the world, from literally 167 different countries that we do know uh, from those IP addresses. Um, and together between this project and an offshoot project with which Aaron Meisner started called Backyard World's Cool Neighbors, uh, which also searches for moving objects in the WISE data in a different differently optimized way, uh, a total of 10 million classifications uh, submitted. Next slide. That's since 2017. So the science team, um, uh, I think one of the secrets is the success of the project is that, that well, the people that I'm working with uh, um, are just super cool and they're okay sharing things with their colleagues and our team has been growing. We've, uh, the science team has grown um, over those years and it now encompasses folks um, at, at IPAC, UC San Diego, University of Le uh, Leicester, uh, University of Montreal, Amherst. Um, so uh, I just want to point this out because the second half of our, half of our conversation is going to be about um, women in the field. So the project started out, the very first conversation that ever had about it was me and Jackie Faraday. Um, and you'll see looking at the list that um, women are not half, it's not 50-50 on the project, but um, female professionals are are, are on our team. Uh, next slide. Um, so you, you haven't heard us uh, bragging that we discovered the ninth planet, right? Uh, however, we uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, we discover some really cool brown dwarf. And uh, in fact, I get to brag that uh, the project has found 12% of all known stellar and substellar objects uh, to a distance of 60 parsecs. At this so here's a graph of all the brown dwarfs um, and some low mass stars probably stuck in there too. Um, so a brown dwarf is, you may recall, it's a ball of gas, uh, which is too low in mass to sustain hydrogen burning. So think of this as something, you know, most of the ones on this plot are somewhere between um, Jupiter, uh, maybe even between 15 Jupiters and 80 Jupiters in mass. But at the low end, they are degenerate with planets. Uh, often people confuse them for planets and planets for brown dwarfs. Uh, so 
Um, they're very important analogs. When you get a good spectrum of a brown dwarf, you're often getting essentially a spectrum of a planet. And so they're important in that regard as well. Did I do justice to the survey of the whole field, Adam? Adam's like, no. <laughs> no, you've only got so much time. You did great. <laughs> All right. Um, we've done some amazing science. Um, uh, I mentioned the first extreme T subdwarfs. Uh, we just had a nature paper on the aurora on, on a brown dwarf. That was Jackie led that. A whole lot of uh, really cool what are called Y dwarfs, which is the coldest category of uh, brown dwarfs. The ones that are really uh, pretty darn hard to tell from a planet. We found also a cool white dwarf discovery. So one of our volunteers realized that you could use the project to search for white dwarfs. And this, this is his own pivot. You know, just like really clever, curiosity-driven project that, that Melina came up with and um, uh, resulted in a, a, you know, amazing discovery uh, of, of the white dwarf with the disc. And it's the oldest one. So it's the, the it's a peek into the far distant future of the solar system. So it's an analog to the far distant future of the sun. Uh, we've... Uh, published more than 34 papers of different kinds, at least 20, uh, and can correct me here if I'm wrong, at least 20 I counted are in referee journals. Next slide. Oh, I already gave some of these stats before. So, okay, so at least 20 referee journals, something like another 20, uh, sorry, um, no, let me start, start fresh. Okay, so, um, uh, one, uh, uh, so um, here's some pictures of, of our of our awesome volunteers. So we have this thing called Advanced User Group, which uh, I'll tell you more about in a second. And 361 people are members of the email list for the Advanced User Group. Of these, 94 have discovered Brown Dwarf candidates. 40 of them have co-authored papers. Four of them have authored software packages. And for our co eyes, oh, like Leopold on selected JWST proposals. Um, so we discovered all kinds of cool brand doors, but you know, I, I think our, our greatest discoveries are the people that we work with are really awesome volunteers. Next slide. All right, so now here we go. Uh, this is the process that that I'd love to get people's insights on. So, how do we? Um, invite people? How do we bring people from being casual users, stopping by Zooniverse? Um, that's the big number, 175,000. How do we um, convert those people sort of down our marketing funnel to becoming members of our advanced user team? This is how we do it. We have, besides Zooniverse, we have a Google form. We actually have multiple Google forms at this point, uh, but this is one of the Google forms. Um, and it's called the Think You've Got One form. Sometimes we abbreviate it as the TYGO or TYGO form. And um, so it sounds like what it's called. If you think you discovered something, don't wait for us to get around to analyzing the Zooniverse data. Go ahead and fill out this form, send it to the science team directly. And, uh, but it takes more doing than just the usual clicking on Zooniverse sort of activity. So as you'll see here, you have to, um, this is just the beginning of the form. It stretches on for a while. It asks you to look up the object in some professional archives. You have to look it up in Simbad. You have to look it up in Vizier. Uh, you have to look it up using this tool called WiseView, uh, which is written by one of our, our volunteers, Dan Castleton. Anyway, you have to do a bunch of more sophisticated checks of your object. And um, in a way, it's analogous to, um, this is sort of analogous to what things, what, how things went on the SunGrazer project, where you guys remember the SunGrazer project, where people started finding comets in, or comet candidates in the SOHO archive. And then they would go to, um, to Carl Badams and say, hey, is this a comet? Is this a comet? And after a while, Carl got frustrated and he created this whole web page saying, if you think you found a comet, uh, here's what you have to do. Go look it up here, look it up here, check to see whether this is, you know, he wrote all the steps he would go through to vet his candidates and he asked people to do it. 
and the process he discovered, they just celebrated their 5,000th comet discovery, that team. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so uh, that that's what kind of gave me the idea to to try this process. Um, so so we've got these forms now where people go and fill out. We ask them to do these more sophisticated tasks. Then if they submit the form, who cares if they did it right, right? We, we don't check. I mean, we check the objects, of course. That's one thing that that huge, you know, task that Adam does is he goes through these objects and sees what what um, what discoveries are in there and it's been a you know a mother of discoveries uh, but um, regardless of whether they've discovered anything or even if they filled it out correctly uh, we still take their email addresses just as an expression of interest you know you took the time to try to figure out how to use this form you're, you're clearly serious about the project I invite them I send them an email that says please join our Google group and then uh, that's how we got 361 folks on our Google group. So, um, all right, next slide. So that's our, those the sec second step in our intake. First step on our intake process, you got to discover the project in the universe. Second step, step you've got to think you found something and fill out that. Um, I mentioned that we have this sister project called Cool Neighbors. Uh, has the same shares science team science team meetings everything is shared between backer worlds plant nine backer world cool neighbors and this is run by Aaron Meisner. Next slide. The uh, advanced user group is also shared with cool neighbors. So a second shot at people finding us uh, is using cool neighbors and using the think you've got one forms on cool neighbors. So this brings me to the first to uh, the two questions uh, that I would love to get your input on. And uh, these questions come from, uh, I brought up this, this, I brought this up in our, our meeting. So, oh, I forgot to mention, this is crucial. Our advanced user group every week gets invited to at least two weekly Zoom meetings with the science team. So Davy uh, Kirkpatrick at IPAC runs a Saturday morning call, and I lead a two a Thursday afternoon call, which just wrapped up. And these projects, everybody on that three hundred sixty one person list is invited to. And uh, Davy does his on Saturdays with the idea that it would help reach folks who were, you know, uh, maybe they work during the week, right? That's that's a big a big uh, challenge to overcome is that a lot of volunteers are are working during the week, just like just like we are. Uh, but Saturday call helps reach people in different time zones, people with different work schedules, and so on. Uh, and um, so uh, we have these regular Zoom calls, and I brought up this idea, Sarah's idea of having these lab meeting events on the Zoom calls, and said, "Hey, what problems are we working yet? What what do we need to improve about the?" And the first thing, the first thing that the volunteers on the call said was, we want faster feedback. We're tired of having to wait until you guys get around to, um, you know, discovering, you know, sorry, uh, following up on our objects and writing a paper about it or otherwise announcing uh, what we've done uh, or finally tweeting about something. Uh, it's too slow for us and it's it's not so fun. Please give us faster feedback on whether we're doing the project correctly. So that's the first question is how we can do that. And the second question is, as Sarah mentioned, we have a, a dearth of women among our advanced users. So when I go to, uh, when I fire up a Zoom meeting for one of these calls with our advanced users, um, the, um, it's it's mostly women. Sorry, it's mostly men. Um, we have lots of women on our science team, as you saw, but among the advanced users, it's it's mostly um, mostly males. So let's start with the feedback question. Actually, let's start before we get into questions. Let me ask everybody on on Back Your Roles team game if they have anything that they want to add to my presentation. Uh, 
free do you have anything you want to share did i did i cover everything more or less uh i think overall um it was really good i'm sure once we get into the discussion i'll have some more additional input thank you so team you had two more slides the one that's shown and i think there's one more on this yeah i thought i then this is going into the discussion about feedback so okay. I just to check, did I present the project accurately? Uh, Leopold, did I cover it? Yes. Uh, maybe I can add that one of the interesting features of the Backyard World projects is that it's uh, adapted to a whole range of uh, competence, of, um, of skills. Um, it's designed to be accessible to whoever might be interested, if, but without any background, like just people who will want to contribute to the project. However, um, one of the successes of the project is to also feed volunteers into digging deeper if they want to uh, by doing queries, by running programs. So this multi-levels multi, multi -levels, uh, commitment is quite interesting. And uh, yes, the, the, the Zooniverse interface versus the advanced user group uh, really committed into that. Thanks, Leopold. By the way, if I mess things up, feel free to tell me that I said prompt. <laughs> um, Adam, do you have anything to add before I go on? No, I think you did a great job. I think one thing, um, just for a piece of context, is is uh, the the thing you've got one for me is is excellent, um, and we've we're getting tons of submissions, but you know we're up to close to 100,000 submissions. So it's hard. Uh, one of the big challenges is when if someone says, what happened to this object? You know, that's it's a it's it can be a bookkeeping nightmare. And it is, you know, part of it is on us. Like, I didn't realize we were going to get that many submissions when we started. And so, you know, maybe if I did, I would have I would have started bookkeeping a, a different way. But it's another challenge on our part is is just the the quantity, the volume that we're getting of of classifications and submissions is is um uh sometimes difficult to manage so if anyone has uh, tips that they use for for that kind of thing that would be great yeah thank you so here are the ways that we currently get feedback we have um we've made use of the zooniverse talk pages and some of our volunteers have been really active helpful as talk moderators, people reading leading Zooniverse projects, you know what I'm talking about. This is bullet, bulletin board where people will uh, just post info, chat about their favorite objects, right? Um, and that's probably the most uh, vigorous, I guess, I'll say feedback system we have. Um, then we have, as I mentioned, we have the advanced users get all, access to all sorts of stuff. Then we have um, public announcements. We try to, you know, share the good news. Well, we tweet um, not so often, very much these days, because I'm disappointed by the direction that Twitter has gone. Um, we take advantage of the NASA um, social media system and so on. We uh, send out email blasts. We put our press releases. All that kind of, you know, success stories. Uh, reporting, but again, the the that's a very slow feedback process. What we're missing is the rapid feedback process, where someone does a classification on Zooniverse and then rapidly gets feedback on did I do this correctly or not. And we're working on implementing a system like that for cool neighbors. Um, let me go to the next slide and show you what the Zooniverse classification system, Zooniverse uh, instant feedback system looks like. And maybe Cliff can help me describe this. So Gravity Spy has implemented this is a different universe project, has system where if you, you classify an object and um, sometimes this little pop-up will appear after you classify the object. And here this one says, when our experts classify this image, they labeled it as a whistle. This is a very gentle way of saying, um, you know, I I I purposely classified this poorly to see what happened. So very gently telling me that I did it wrong. 
uh, it's a whistle. I probably classify it as blip or something like that. Um, some of the WISP classes can look quite similar. So please keep trying your best. Check out the tutorial and if you got more guidance. So there we go. I classified it wrong. Instantly, I get a pop-up saying, here's what the correct answer is. So I'm learning along the way how better to do classifications of gravity spine. So the next slide will show you what that looks like behind the scenes on Zooniverse in the project builder. So the first step, by the way, to getting this going is you have to talk to someone at Zooniverse. Uh, I think Laura uh, helped me set this up. Um, so the Zooniverse has to turn on for you the feedback feature. Uh, and then you have to um, use the, the project builder to put in the parameters of your feedback. And you have to upload a set of gold standard objects for which you know what the answer is. So pre-classified objects. And we're working on implementing this in the cool neighbor side of backyard worlds. Um, a challenge with the, we haven't implemented it for the Planet Nine side of backyard worlds because we can't uh, we can't make a, a gold set of gold standard set of objects. <laughs> um, it's cool neighbors is very much more amenable to this because it's a simple yes or no question. But for um, the Planet Nine project. It's a matter of locating objects in the field and, and marking them. And so a given field may have zero or it may have 17 different objects. And um, the diff some of them are interesting for some projects and some of them are not interesting for other projects. And it's pretty complicated to come up with a list of like 100 um frames where, every, where people in the science team all agree that these are the ones that are of interest and this one is trash. Um, sometimes they really require more research to figure out what's going on. And anyway, we thought we would start with cool neighbors because it's more straightforward. But that's about what we've gotten up to. We paused because uh, cool neighbors encountered a bigger issue, which is it ran out of data. But we're going to upload some more data and keep working on this feedback system. Uh, I think that's all I slides I have about Zooniverse feedback. Yeah, that's it. So the questions, you know, I would love to know, um, I'd love to hear from, from you all about what you do to try to give quick feedback to your volunteers, to sustain people's interest, to train them, and what we could do better is, you know, together to try to improve the feedback situation across all the various different projects. And I'm going to pass the, I think I'll pass the baton to Sarah. Okay, so Jeff got his hand up first, so go ahead, Jeff. Hi, everybody. So uh, Mark and I have have talked a lot about um, a team chat platform in Exoplanet Watch. And Sarah, you you can tell me what you think about uh, Exoplanet Watch's Slack channel and our workspace and and that as a platform to give users quick feedback right away. I mean, I'm looking at it right now, and we. We have people sharing their data. We have people sharing their reductions, and and the team members are able to you know, you know give thumbs up or or give a shout out and and do it pretty quickly. Yeah, that's a great one. Actually, I forgot to mention Backyard Worlds has a Slack channel. Hi, Jeff. I'm I'm pursuant to our conversation. Is anybody else using Slack for citizen science on here? You are too, Stella. Awesome. I have a question related to this that it, it sounds like um, the question about or the request for quicker feedback, there are two parts of it. There's one, I want feedback on what I'm doing to know if I'm doing it right so I can build my confidence, which is, I would say, one kind of feedback. And that may be the kind of feedback that the Zooniverse tools that you're talking about implementing address. The second part, Mark, that you mentioned was um, especially advanced users who've contributed something, they want to know what happens with it. Like I found something, we had a conversation, everyone agreed it was a good candidate. Now what? And I want it to happen now. So it's there's the feedback to help me learn. And then there's it seems like there's a second part that's like the pace of science to know where my contribution is moving the field. If that's overstating. Is that... Adam's nodding. 
Yeah, that sounds exactly right. And and, and I think there are two. And it's hard to know exactly when when people said they wanted faster feedback, if it was um, which one. It may have been referring to both kinds of feedback or um, if they're leaning one way or the other. I think the first, am I doing this right, is the more um, maybe pressing and it would be nice to have um you know the other one we can work on and i can you know i can do the other one just takes me a little time um uh but the the kind of am i doing it right is the more the kind of pressing issue i think that do you well, agree with that mark that's that's the one that i think that people were mentioned that's the one people were concerned about on our call the am i doing it right immediate kind of feedback and that's something I have observed, Jeff, and you can tell me if I'm right. It feels like the Slack channel in Exoplanet Watch, on which I'm a lurker, I'm not a participant. There's a lot of people who are eager to share what they've learned over the years of participating in the project. And that space gives newcomers a chance to say, what am I doing? Did I do this right? And there are a lot of people who are ready to jump in and say, yeah, do this, or look up this, or this is how you do this step of it. Um, is that, do you think that's right? If we're pulling these two parts, or these two aspects well, I, back apart, does Slack do one part better than the other? Yeah, I, I see other hands, and, I, and so I just, I'll just add quickly that um, that I think Slack is, is especially interesting in terms of a tool to do all those things. And I would also just add that a third aspect of the feedback of community is just to give these people the space and the communal connections between each other, not just between us and the and the and the and the volunteers, between them, themselves as well, uh, for themselves to find like-minded people and just to build their own community. Because a lot of these people, you know, one person in particular is uh, is a is a retiree in, in Texas, and he has no one else to talk about this stuff with. Uh, so it's just you know that's just one example. Right, and we can all nerd out with him. Um, so yeah. I'm... Yeah, I feel our conversation drifting towards uh, the topics that might address the second part or the second question that the team is bringing forward. Um, let's hear from Shelby and Stella and then maybe we'll go to the second question before too long. Shelby. Hey, everybody. Um, I didn't mean to stifle the conversation because I, I love hearing about the Slack channels. I'm honestly very jealous uh, of everyone's Slack channels. Um, and it's something that my team and I have discussed a lot about um, instituting. And ultimately, we've decided um, that it's just one more thing um, that, you know, we have kind of a, a bit more of an older demographic, a lot of retirees um, interacting with our projects, very local project that um, right now our main forms of communication is, is it's email or phone calls. Um, so, you know how they make jokes like the Barbie movie, like Ken's job is beach. My job is email or phone calls. Um, <laughs> that's like all I do. And it's very time consuming. Um but that's how I'm giving this fast feedback. And especially if we're hearing from people uh, about a specific like bloom, algal bloom or an event, they'll reach out to me. I'll reach out to folks that are in the area that, you know, we have partners in the area to coordinate us getting a sample from them or, or someone else getting a sample from them. We're trying to do that more and more. Um, but I'm totally jealous of the Slack channel. I, I love it so much. And having that, it's like a great platform for building community. Um, I just don't think that my current project, it fits within that framework just for the size, for so many reasons. Um, but yeah, I didn't know if anybody had any other, in the past when I've attended these meetings and chatting with folks, people have mostly pitched Slack or something like that. Um, and while I think it's totally worthwhile to be sending these targeted emails, you know, not just these mass emails to everybody that I could send relatively quickly, you know, actually taking the time to figure out for the most part, I have pretty good working knowledge of, you know, who's where, but sometimes, you know, cross-referencing data, making sure I know exactly if I'm reaching everybody. It takes a lot of time. I think it's worthwhile, but if anyone has any suggestions or solutions, I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that was it for the question that Brooke posed. Fast feedback. Yeah, I, I have one quick comment on that, and it's not, um, I don't know, it, it's, it's, 
Well, anyway, so uh, Leopold can chime in too, because I know he's very active in the Slack. But one thing, uh, just so you don't think it's too much of a barrier of like, oh, one more thing I have to do. Uh, we have the Backyard World Slack, and a lot of it is the the volunteers interacting with each other, answering their own questions based on their experience and, and what they've done. So we very rarely, unless, you know, we really want to get involved in the conversation unless there's like a question that can't be answered. So um no, I, 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 that's why it's appealing to me is that it's not so much of an effort on my end that it's like other folks communicating with each other. I think what's been communicated from my team is it's one more thing for a volunteer to learn how to interact with if the Slack platform is new to them, um, because we're already training them on not only, you know, scientific collection methods that may be completely foreign to them. We have an app that we have them use that's new. We have a, a database, so an open access database where they upload the data for us that unfortunately the app and the database don't talk to each other which is super frustrating and I don't you could I could talk for an hour about that <laughs> um so it's like we're already asking so much that also asking them to you know engage with and learn a new uh, platform like slack we think it's just going to be too much at this point I think if it gets bigger uh, the project gets bigger and expands to other regions I think something like slack would have to happen um because there's just not the infrastructure set up for that. Um, so yeah, so that so that's what I meant by that. You raise a couple interesting points, Shelby. Well, one, everybody, Shelby's with the Chesapeake Water Watch. She's looking at collecting um, water quality data and matching it with satellite data to mm. train the satellites better. So there's a topic area, different topics seem to attract different demographics and then different demographics are engaged and um, are fluent, frankly, in different kinds of communication styles. So there, this this is not like nothing in citizen science um, or like everything in citizen science. There's no one size fits all, but there's some good threads we're pulling out here. Um, Stella, thanks for your patience. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. And actually, I will start with what she the, the last sentence that you made, um, there's no such thing as one size fits all. You have to actually cater things to your specific communities' needs. Uh, and especially when you cross borders, then you have to actually take into account cultures, time zones, interests, and gender, and um, perceptions. So um, I don't have an answer for you. I'm going to out with that. But a couple of things that uh, could perhaps help um, uh, with uh, those who don't have confidence in their skills. They just need to build confidence. One of the, um, for them, one of the big uh, advantage of being in part of this group will be to have access directly to the scientists, not necessarily to other peers. Uh, and this is actually sometimes a big attractor. Oh, I'm going to be working with Dr. So-and-so from blah, 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 on this high profile project using satellite data. I mean, how cool is that for a, uh, you know, Thanksgiving uh, dinner conversation? Uh, so at some point, uh, I'm pretty sure that there's vigorous training that is going through all these universe platforms, and you can definitely point to people to to some uh, um, uh, training data where they can actually build confidence just by going through exercises where you do know the answer before they get comfortable enough to go through an exercise where you just don't know the answer. Also, we need to, to understand where people come from, right? As scientists, we're very, very comfortable with uncertainty. We're very comfortable with risk. We're very comfortable looking at data for days and days and days with no results. That's not everyday life. People are not used to being wrong. People actually try to be very risk averse. It's always black or white for people's comfort level. So once we embrace that um, and think about our science projects as something that people are not uh, familiar with, they're very uncomfortable with, they really want to try. You have more than 300,000 users. I mean, that's mind blowing. It's like the whole planet is united around this project. Forget about borders, forget about language, language uh, barriers, right? It's so powerful. But at the same time, let's face it, even with your 300 plus um, advanced users, you can't provide this one-on-one -on -one personalized attention to absolute, to everybody but you still want them to be engaged. It wouldn't be fantastic to have half a million of them. How about 3 million? And you know, the sky is not the limit as we know in astronomy. So perhaps this kind of training data is perhaps a couple of webinars or of how to's or something that is easy, something that leads to quick success for those individuals so that they are encouraged to keep 
up with the project, keep up with the, the flow. Um, Slack is fantastic when you're talking to 100 people. Slack can be very chaotic when you have 300 people, when you have 3,000 people, and I don't even want to be on a Slack channel with 300,000 people. Uh, where, you know, conversations are mixed and matched and you don't really know where exactly your thread is. So um, I don't have a good question, a good answer for you, especially because we're talking about the, the huge group right now. And it's not exactly within our or my direct experiences, um, uh, within my direct experiences, dealing with that group at the same time, even asynchronously. But again, blogs and the talks that um, that the uh, Zooniverse platform has is very powerful for that. And also, I do understand why we all want users to interact with each other, but it's so important for the scientists to be there. Even if you're answering what you consider a simple question where 100,000 other people would not be answered, just pitch in, just have a presence. Even if it's once every like 100 uh, Slack chats, uh, we also need to recognize that this is a time sink. I mean, that takes you away from your science, that takes you away from the, your day job, takes you away from your family. But at the same time, it's the same thing for those volunteers, right? They are there because of the passion, because of the... So it's really very important for them to know that this scientist, Dr. Kushner, they're working with, is actually... And I, I'm pointing at you, because I know Mark's in forever. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Kushner is actually listening and they are responding and they're going to say something. And maybe they're not going to say directly to me, but we're part of the same group, Right. Um, and again, have them keep the conversation with their friends and family, the family dinner that, you know, I was part of this conversation. Dr. Kushner said something, right? This is what they said. And I was part of that group. So think about the prestige that people get out of this, the, the satisfaction. And that that actually feeds into this, um, mm -hmm. um, this instant gratification that people need to get out of a, a hobby like that. It's not their job. They're not getting paid for that. It's great to have discoveries, but you know, how many discoveries do we in a scientific life make every day? Um, they will need to have patience. They need to persist. Not the, you know, the first uh, attempt will not result to a fantastic exor discovery or, you know, planet nine or anything like that, but they need to keep going, right? So how do they do that? So that's it. Thank you for reminding us that citizen science projects are a meeting of many cultures. And that's right. Scientists have a kind of acceptable way of doing things or a, a way that's kind of the norm that may or may not be understood by participants and crossing that, um, making that available and open and transparent to newcomers is really important. So I'm, we're at a quarter of, I want to move to the second question, but Fareed, do you want to speak quickly to this one? And then Jeff, you've been lovely about moving yourself behind people. Maybe we can hold you off until after we've opened up the second question. And Thank please you. type things in the chat if we don't hear them out loud. Don't yes. Worry. Yeah. Do put thoughts in the chat. Right. So I just wanted to uh, mention someone, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch her name, but they they mentioned it was uh, with the Smithsonian logo on the top. Uh, yep. She mentioned the difficulty of, for example, using Slack when a lot of the uh, community is older individuals who are not as comfortable with Slack. And then you somewhat pointed out the the variety of backgrounds that we have here. And I do know, for example, you know, she's saying, "Hey, I wish you know maybe like my uh, volunteers were more comfortable with something like Slack." But I know that, for example, for people around my age group, we hate Slack. Um, <laughs> we're really not a big fan of Slack. Uh, there are alternatives like Discord, uh, where you can have bots help with the moderation, uh, where you can have different uh, groups, where you can have one, for example, chatting about, uh, you know, we had some people in the Planet Nine group that were primarily interested in Planet Nine. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't care as much necessarily about the Brown Dwarf news. And then we have people about um, mainly about the brown dwarfs, right? In the in the group that maybe are not even truly concerned about Planet Nine itself, um, and maybe you know having the ability to. And I, I know Slack does this as well, uh, but again, I guess that that goes more with the with the whole thing about different age groups and different backgrounds. And then you also have to account countries, right? Like you were saying too, different cultures, different countries do use 
different um uh, apps. I know GroupMe is very big in in the United States, but uh, WhatsApp is much much bigger in Costa Rica, where I'm from. Um, so you know, not only would it it it, it is I understand like the the wanting to uh, appeal to like you know the 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 group and having being uh, struggling with not with them not being as comfortable with Slack. But I can tell you that issue would occur regardless because we do have such a large variety of people. Um, so don't feel, I guess, like, you know, it's on you necessarily that I think that just comes with uh, having so many people from so many different backgrounds. And obviously everyone has an opinion. So everyone, everyone's going to have a preference over one or the other. I prefer Discord very strongly. <laughs> um, I just like the the layout. I use it very often. So if I, if, you know, the conversation was on Discord, uh, I would probably be able to collaborate more often. And I think that's part of it. I think Discord is a lot more for casual use as well. And I think there would be value in uh, using something like that for at least younger people. And then when it comes to the feedback, <clears throat> I think uh, Stella brought up one point, which is, um, you know, we do have to somewhat instill a sense of patience because science does take time. And uh, I know that when I came in, it took me like a month to be able to, uh, get Adam to find my discovery <laughs> and actually show me what it was that I found uh, so I could take a look at it. And at first I didn't understand why it wasn't in, uh, you know, uh, the good source list, for example, one thing that we have to follow up more on. And uh, at first I was confused, but that, that, that stuff that even they don't know sometimes, right? They need to do all this follow-up um, in order to determine what it is that they're gonna do with this object. And um, I think one way to somewhat deal with that issue from when it comes for, to the feedback is giving a more positive notion to finding stuff that's not what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't tell you, hey, you did find a brown dwarf with this specific qualities and this is what we're gonna study about it. But I think that if uh, you know we have catalogs and I'm not sure how easy it would be to implement these catalogs into the Zooniverse interface, but if we use catalogs like, uh, you know, Gaia, for example, we, it's 1.5 billion sources. Um, that's a good starting point. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 1.5 billion sources, they, a lot of them have photometry. Uh, most of them have astrometry. So with all this stuff, you can at least say, hey, you clicked on something that, you know, we're looking primarily for cooler objects. So if you find something that's very obviously already cataloged as an A-type star or an O-type star, maybe returning that. And in that sense, they're failing to find what we're looking for. But at the same time, you're telling them, here, this is what you actually found. So then you're learning in that sense. And uh, you, you maybe you feel like that time, it's not like, oh, hey, I got on and this whole time, I didn't learn how to find a brown dwarf. I didn't find a single brown dwarf. Instead, you're saying, hey, I got on and now I know how to identify A and O type stars because that's all I clicked on the whole time at first. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I thought was interesting to me in the images, but now I know those are A and O type stars and that's not really what we're looking for here. So that, that would be my suggestion in that sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Leopold, quick, and then we'll move on to open up the second question. I want you to get all your answers. Okay, I will do my best to be quick, but um, I really liked what Stella explained. Like from my perspective, it really makes sense. I believe that what retained me into the project over the years is the fact that it was a very long uh, learning curve. I, I kept learning over and over. And uh, I think building resources the way we did, there are tutorials made by volunteers. There are uh, members of the team that uh, share them, their knowledge. So, of course, it's a great pleasure um, to know that we are talking with Dr. McKirchner, with uh, Dr. Schneider. Yes, it's... Of course, it's um, it's it's good to the ego, but beyond that, it's also very good to to learn. It's a bit, I believe, the same logic as a, a video game. You are training little by little and assembling the skill set. When I started uh, the project, I knew nothing scientific about astronomy. I liked the topic, but I did not have actual knowledge. And little by little, I learned the stellar classification. I learned what a brown dwarf is. I learned programming from scratch. Like I had no background whatsoever into it. And it took me even to like 
having a little adventure with uh, with uh, self entrepreneurship like totally in another field than uh, astronomy and i think this is most of the fun from it is actually learning and the idea of making workshops uh, making videos like teaching other people is actually a great way to interact and uh, to reach out to a massive amount of people um it's it's in, to some extent it's some part of feedback because it what it it gives like um an interaction and an answer to um what i believe people uh, are looking for in these projects and creates a sense of community of course I love what you just said. You get to something that's really near and dear to my heart about all of this work. I know NASA really cares about publications, but there's so many other things happening in projects and you celebrating um, celebrating the learning and that the learning is can be one of the points I think is just so wonderful. Okay, I am going to share the slides again, if I can figure out where my share slides is. Um, and then, one of you can narrate these few slides about gender balance, and then we can come back to our conversation. We're gonna to have to come back to this another day because we don't have enough time to hit this. It's a really important topic. So I hope we can reconvene on another day and come okay. back. So I'll just set the stage now, which is that um, across uh, citizen science, you know, major platforms, uh, there's, um, a little bit of information about gender balance. So, you know, think about Zooniverse has 2.6 million people participating. They have a survey of 300 people, right? My naturalist, even bigger, uh, uh, sir, you know, uh, has a survey of 202 participants, right? Okay, so these surveys aren't even representing the whole group, but the little that we know is that the gender balance is sort of 50-50 across the platform across a variety of projects. Uh, next slide. Sorry, too many. However, in um, amateur astronomy and in astronomy-related citizen science projects, there is an extreme gender imbalance, right? So take a look at the picture of the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association, Amateur Astronomy Conference goers. We know what the gender ratio is in those conferences. They are often less than 5% women in those conferences. Okay, So great blog post by Rachel Freed uh, about uh, possible reasons explain what's going on in amateur astronomy. Um, Stella Kafka can say way more about this as the former president of AAVSO, the Association of Amateur Astronomers. Um, next slide. And then of course, um, so I'm staring at screenfuls of our advanced participants who I, who I adore. And we have professional scientists who are women. We just don't have a lot of um, volunteers who are women. So what's going on? Scratching my head. Of course, there are lots of bad ideas on how to fix the problem. We don't want to single people out. We don't want to place burden on women who are on our team or who might possibly on our, be on our team. Uh, next slide. So I don't know how to solve the problem yet in um, backyard worlds. I don't even know to the extent that it is a problem because you know, it. this is a volunteer project. It's an ask. We ask people to share their time and maybe people just don't feel like sharing their time. And that's that has to be okay with us, you know? Um, but I do have some inklings of how to address the problem at the NASA level, but wearing my other hat is, as citizen science officer. So here's some things that we've tried at the NASA level. We have a space act agreement with the Girl Scouts, right? We celebrate the International League of Women and Girls in Science uh, with with uh, social media posts. We have article coming out in NASA's Women in STEM Talent Community Newsletter, right? But the question remains, um, what exactly is the problem in backyard worlds and how should we address it? Okay. I hope we can come back to this in a day. Yep. Uh, um, can I get okay. Patricia and Estella's, if you, have something real quick. You can tell us something wise. I'd love to hear it. Well, I mean, I think still, sorry. Go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Pat Knezik. I'm an astrophysicist at NASA headquarters. Um, I think Stella brought up a really important point about a sense of belonging. If you don't see yourself or you don't feel comfortable, you are unlikely to stay and participate. I do think we need to talk uh, more extensively in three more minutes, we're not going to solve the issue. But I, 
also um, who brings you to the table can really matter, right? Uh, so I, I managed the NASA Hubble Fellowship Program, which is an early career postdoctoral award. And the current and po past uh, fellowship fellows are one of our best sources of bringing in new potential candidates um, and, and the voices of what they're interested in seeing for the program and how it would grow. So th those are two quick things I think we could discuss in terms of for your specific program, Mark, um, uh, mechanisms that might help uh, bring things in. And, and then my last thing is that for either your advanced users group, you should be thinking about what actually is your goal with bringing more people in, especially more women? Um, is it just to get gender balance or, or what? And I, I, I think we need to understand the problem you're trying to solve besides just number statistics. Thanks. Thank you. Great question. Um, Stella. You must have thoughts. Lots of thoughts. I'm going to confine them in 30 seconds. Number one, seconding everything that Pat said, um, to, to have a sense of belonging in order to participate somewhere. And we need to see ourselves succeeding in order to um, be encouraged to stay there. So let's uh, table this for another time. Um, but a question back, of course, is how do you solve the chicken and the egg problem, right? You want people to see themselves, but what, you know, you'd, first you need some women for them to see, right? Um, so I, I, I agree. And in our last minute, I will say over the course of my career, I have seen that you can start small. In other words, if you bring in a couple of early career women um, or graduate students or something like that and, and get them interested in being users and then they are interested in going out and getting more people, that yep. becomes a pipeline. Exactly. And create safe spaces and create your strong core team. And from there, you can actually spread around. And am I right? Gonna, I have to, to go. I'm so sorry. Bye. Bye. Okay. So what I'm going to do as is our practice, I'm going to stop the recording, but we can keep having our conversation.